I had already made a movie with Martin Scorsese. I'd made Alice's in the Fury War, uh, where I played a kind of a street urchin, you know, a bad girl, but definitely a young girl. So he knew me and he knew my work and we'd had a good time together. Uh, and then he called my mother up and said, you know, I have this role for a prostitute in New York. And my mother thought she, he was crazy. She said, well, I think she's totally wrong for it, but if you want me to bring her in, okay. So she brought me in my uniform, my school uniform, and uh, he said, well, you know, I think she's perfect. And my mom thought he was insane. And then we read the script, and it really was, truthfully, one of the most brilliant scripts I've ever read. There was a girl who had, had lived a life that was very similar to my characters. She'd been a prostitute in New York. She'd been a drug addict. Um, uh, kind of a skinny, pasty, blonde girl. I know that Paul Schrader and Martin Scorsese sort of used her as a model in some ways for my character. So they found this girl um, who sort of corresponded to the character and uh, they said, you know, I want you to come over to the Pierre Hotel and we want you to hang out with her. I mean, I'm 12 years old, you know, so I, I come there and I said, hi. She said, you know, hi. That's pretty much it. I didn't have anything to say, you know. I think they thought that maybe we'd have like, you know, like a kind of an improv bonding thing, but I was really just a 12-year-old, so. Uh, she does play the friend in the movie. There's a scene of us walking across the street and Robert De Niro almost runs over me. <laughs> she pulls me out of the way of the cab. That's the girl. I wish I could tell you that I was uh, as well-researched as Robert De Niro in that movie. The bit of preparation that I did have was that Robert De Niro would call me up on the phone while we were in prep in New York and say, you know, can you come out and have coffee with me? And he'd pick me up and then we'd get in a subway or we'd get in a taxi and we'd go to different diners all around town. We'd go to some places in Spanish Harlem, some places in different areas. And he would usually say nothing, literally nothing. And I was, you know, after about two or three times and I realized the guy was never gonna say anything, I'd start having conversations with other people in the diner, you know, ordering things, playing with my food. And um, what happens is I got very comfortable with him. And then after a while, he would rehearse the scene with me. He'd rehearse the scene over and over and over and over again. And as a young actor, of course, I already knew my lines. So I became incredibly bored just rehearsing the scene over and over and over with him. And then towards the last few encounters that we had, he just threw in improvisations. So here was a scene that I knew incredibly well. And then he'd drop in something that was just a total surprise. Oh, so what's so important? Doing something for the government. Now, when I think back and think of the method to his madness, you know, one, he was getting me to be very comfortable with him to the point where I was actually even bored by him. Uh, two, he was sort of teaching me that the best way to improvise a scene is to know it like the back of your hand. And then you can riff off and go on to other things. God, I don't know who's weirder, you or me. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was a child actor, so throughout my whole career, I've been subject to the welfare board laws, uh, which I think are very good. Uh, it means you can only work a certain amount of hours during a day. It means that, uh, uh, you know, they can't work you all night uh, without letting you sleep and then make you work again. My mom was always on the set with me, which is part of the law. You have to have a guardian, an appointed guardian, or your parent on set with you all the time. And uh, since I grew up on sets with her, um, it became kind of a partnership. She was never physically on the set while I was shooting. She liked to stay in the trailer and read magazines. That was her thing. She was there to shelter me and protect me, but she wasn't there to kind of grab my career and say it's mine, you know. I remember the wardrobe fittings very well for a taxi driver. Ruth Morley was the costume designer, brilliant costume designer who's died since. But uh, I remember being just completely embarrassed. They made me wear these clothes that I would never wear, you know, hot pants. And I was the kind of girl who, like, I wouldn't wear anklet socks. I would only wear knee socks because I didn't like, like, any part of my leg showing. I mean, I really had clothes phobias. And here I was in platform heels with a ton of makeup on and halter tops. And uh, I was mortified. I was completely embarrassed by it. And I, I remember going with my mom and going shopping with Ruth. And I remember at one point, you know, starting to cry and going, you know, I can't believe I have to wear this awful clothes. And uh, my mom said, you know, this is only a character, it's only a part, and you have to remember that. Listen, mister, it's your time. 15 minutes ain't long. The Board of Education got a hold of the script for Taxi Driver, and uh, they weren't sure whether they would allow me to play it because I was a minor, I was underage, and they wanted to know that making the film wouldn't damage my morals. So there were a variety of things that I had to do in order to be allowed to do the film. I had to meet with a psychiatrist uh, that, that our lawyers had appointed 
frankly, to make a decision whether I was sane or not and whether I could handle it. Um, and there were some things that they uh, had to change. If there were any provocative scenes that um, were too suggestive sexually, uh, the production agreed that they would get a stand-in to be in those scenes. So we all said, well, my sister's the same size. Why don't you have her come? She's, you know, eight years older than I am. So there's my sister Connie, uh, all decked up in kind of prostitute wear. Um, she did, uh, you know, some of the scenes behind the shoulder when there's a question of, you know, whether I'm unzipping his pants or something. That's my sister Connie. And, of course, that makes her laugh now. You know, she's got two kids. One's 22 years old, and, uh, you know, when we look back on that, we laugh a lot. The slow dancing scene with Harvey Keitel is interesting because um, I don't believe there was much dialogue in that scene. I believe there was three words in that scene. And Harvey uh, came in with this whole Barry White song. <laughs> he just, he really liked Barry White and he decided that he wanted to write a Barry White song and that he would be talking to her like a Barry White song. So he came in with this kind of like, you know, you're my woman and I'm your man and all this kind of stuff. The last scene may seem like a wild, spontaneous scene, but it was extremely rehearsed and prepared. Of course, it had to be because it's filled with effects, and at that time, effects were not what they are today. So, I mean, it was really had to be prepared. And when you're in a scene like that, you don't ever think of the blood and guts. I think you look at it technically. You look at it and say, oh, I see the wire there. Or that could have been better here. Or, There's a little shadow over there. Um, so whenever I see that scene, I never see any of the violence. <laughs> I only see the technique that went behind it. I remember being fascinated by uh, all of the tricks, uh, the explosions, uh, the, the false finger, the prosthetic finger, um, uh, by uh, the way that they mixed the blood and uh, the things that they would put into this fake concoction of blood that smelled like a kind of Chinese restaurant caro syrup, you know, very sweet smell. Uh, the, for example, uh, I think Dick Smith t took me aside and said, you, you see, we put little pieces of styrofoam cup. You know what that is? That's skull. We like to put the pieces of skull. And that way, when, you know, you don't just put little pieces of sponge to soak up the blood so it looks like flesh, you also put pieces of skull. So when that splatters on the, uh, on the, uh, on the walls, then, you know, it's not just the blood. Um, and I remember thinking, well, that, that makes sense. I think the 70s in filmmaking, as well as in literature, you know, is a different time than any other time. And I think the golden age for cinema, you know, for me, it's the best, the best movies that I know of in the 70s. Um, precisely because I think people were really concerned or, or interested by the anti-hero, which has pretty much gone away now. I don't think audiences really want to accept the anti-hero anymore. So I, I do think that it would be a movie that would be very difficult to finance nowadays. When I think of Taxi Driver and I think of, um, People have said, oh, the film's too violent, it can inspire violence, and there have been questions about whether a taxi driver inspired violence. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very valid question, uh, and it's something that I deal with every day, N nowadays, really trying to figure out which films are worth making, which films aren't. And how do you discuss violence in our culture? Or do you not discuss it at all? Do you only make movies about, like, Mickey Mouse and, <laughs> you know, dancing bears and stuff? Um, I, think, I think you don't. I think you make films about our culture and about what's difficult and disturbing about our culture with a moral center. And I think the filmmaking in the film really does have a moral center. Even though it is told from the perspective of Travis Bickle, we know where his desperation comes from. Uh, we know that it comes from his loneliness and his alienation and from his inability to belong and to have meaning in his life. Loneliness has followed me my whole life, everywhere. In bars and cars, sidewalks, stores, everywhere. There's no escape from God's lonely man.